Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into calves and forearms. This is our second to last episode that we are wrapping up this muscle series, and we're going to be diving into something that are small overall muscle groups, but there's a lot of details to them that we're going to be diving into. But I thought that it would be best to start this off with a story from you uh, talking about your forearm lust and training (laughs) growing up. Okay. Um, While growing up, forearms were a massive part of what I was required to do every night before I went to bed. Um, I was required to do pull-ups, push-ups, and then uh, wrist rollers, which my dad had made a wrist roller weight for me. He had cut a broomstick off enough to where both of my hands could fit on it, drilled a hole through the middle, and then put a a string. And then that string was cemented into a old Folgers uh, coffee container. Those Mm -hmm. like, they weren't steel, but they were hard material. I don't know exactly what they were made up of. And it was just a couple of pounds. I would say like two to five pounds was in that Folgers uh, container. And I would have to do five to 10 wrist rolls of those every single night. And so I have been desiring to have ginormous forearms. Growing up playing baseball, some of the greatest hitters that I got to watch play and admire had ginormous forearms. And so it was always a muscle (laughs) group that I have yearned for for my entire life still to this day. I really look forward to the day that we're able to start our grow our family. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, be able to show up to soccer practice, (laughs) softball games, baseball games, whatever that is, and just have the meatiest calves and forearms of the dads that are there. I've got a long way to go. Um, I'm not there yet. And I'm much closer to us expanding our family than I am to the ginormous calves and forearms that that I've longed for my entire life. So I've got to step on it if I'm going to get there. I mean, literally from before we got married, he was like, when I'm a dad, I'm going to have jacked forearms. And that was something he made very clear to me when we first started seeing each other. And I'm just, I'm glad that it still remains that you still have those goals. Um, and you're getting after it. Your calves specifically have come a long way. My calves had a lot of, have had a lot of progress. Um, that great picture that you took of me this past weekend, um, I thought, you know, this is going to be a great opportunity for for me to show off my calves and they did not catch an angle. And so that was a deflating moment, but Hey, they have come a long way. Well, I was honestly just looking at your shoulders and back. I didn't even think about your calves even after I took the photo. So I apologize for not making sure your calves had the best angle, but I thought that you looked jocked regardless. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. Well, let's go ahead and dive into forearms first, since that's what we are chatting about. And get into it. Let's get into it. Forearms are complex. There is more than 20 muscles that make up the forearms. And uh, I want to give you guys as much context into this as I possibly can. It's going to be a lot, but I, I feel as though we've broken down the notes in a way that is very easy to digest. So the forearms are going to act on the bones that are within the forearm, of course, on the elbow, wrist, and hand. The wrist itself is a condyloid joint, which means that it can move up or up and down and then side to side and then also in a circular motion which is pretty cool and the elbow is obviously a hinge joint which is going to have us bending which is flexion and then straightening which is going to be extension now the actions of the forearm what i would like for you to do if you're not driving and you're sitting there taking notes and wanting to learn throughout listening to this i want you to stick your arm out in front of you and think of your hand as the middle point 
within a clock. This is going to allow for us to better explain these functions that the hand is, is performing. And as we get into the specific muscle groups within the forearm, this will make it easier to digest. And so if we have our hand extended as if we're the middle of a clock, flexion is going to be you raising your, I'm sorry, <laughs> flexion is going to be you lowering your middle finger down to six on the clock. And then extension is going to be raising it to the uh, 12 on the clock. You have wrist adduction, which is going to be taking your middle finger and pushing over to nine on the clock. And then you're going to have wrist abduction, which is going to be moving the middle finger to the three on the clock. You're also going to have pronation of the, of the hand, which is already the position that you're in. So the top of your hand facing the ceiling, you're also going to have the ability to supinate the hand, which is taking the palm and having it face the ceiling there. The forearm is going to play a large role in gripping things, whether you're carrying groceries, which has been huge for us throughout this <laughs> entire series, or picking up a dumbbell or picking up a barbell. Uh, providing stability for the wrist and hand is also a huge bit here. So the forearms are going to play a large part in your coordination and ability to type or um, being able to write. And then flexion of the elbow, which is going to be uh, attributed to the brachialis and the uh, brachioradialis, which we'll get into those specifically here momentarily. Yeah, that was a great, great um, explanation and a good visual uh, to be able to go through when you're really thinking about the clock um, to know where it goes. Because I think that the terms can sometimes be confusing and you're like, does that mean this or this? So really being able to process it with the clock, I think is good. Are there any other uh, joints that are condyloid joints in the body? Um, so you have a condyloid joint towards the forefoot of your foot and into the toes. Um, but that's, I think the only other one. I was trying to think of like what other joints move that many directions. I guess the the uh, the neck, like the portion of the spine would be somehow in that arena. I don't know if that's if it falls into the exact category, but you have those same functions with the neck. Um, but the wrist is a very unique joint in general. Except gripping things. You can't grip <laughs> yeah. things with your neck, but everything else, pretty fair game here. Yeah, very true. Um, <laughs> so as we get into the specific compartments of the forearm, because it is more than 20 muscle groups, we want to break this down in, into two parts. And so we have an anterior forearm, which is going to be the uh, flexors. And then we have the posterior forearm, which is going to be more of the extensors. And so the anterior uh, portion of the forearm is going to be split into three layers made up of nine muscle groups. Now, with these, the three layers are going to be the superficial, the intermediate, and the deep. We're going to have a fantastic time trying to say these perfectly, <laughs> <laughs> whether it be from my undergrad work or any of my continued education. I'm not sure I've heard these well articulated throughout any of the journey. So we're going to try this all together. Now, the superficial are the ones that we're going to spend our time on today talking about the originating position, the insertion, and the function of them. We're not going to spend a ton of time on the intermediate and deep, as I don't think that it applies totally to what we're trying to talk about today when it comes to hypertrophy, improving the visual appearance. The superficial are going to be the ones that you can make a difference of how it looks and really applying a lot of the, the strength improvements that we're wanting to see. And so what makes up the superficial portion of the anterior compartment of the forearm is going to be the brachialis, the flexor carpi ulnaris, the palmaris longus, the flexor carpi radialis, and the pronator teres. That is a mouthful. It is a sure. mouthful. And it's actually a wristful. <laughs> You're funny. Um, <laughs> the other ones are honestly a little bit more, uh, we'll see. The intermediate is actually just one muscle group being the flexor digitoris, digitorum superficialis. Mm -hmm. Flexor digitorum superficialis. I think that's right. The deep portion of the anterior compartment of the forearm is the flexor polyseus longus the flexor digitorum 
profundus and pronator uh, quadratus. Those sounded pretty good to me. Okay. Um, so that's what makes up the, the nine muscle groups of the anterior compartment of the forearm. Perfect. So are we going to dive into those superficial ones? We sure are. Um, so with the superficial uh, compartment here, the first one is going to be the brachialis. This is actually going to run up under the bicep. And this is one that we're going to be impacting the uh, flexion of the elbow. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity here to improve the density or width to the um, upper arm and obviously the upper portion of the lower arm as well. So in terms of visual appearance, this is an important muscle group to be training. It originates on the humerus, actually so far up that it's right under the um, insertion of the delt. So surprisingly, this is this is going to be the highest in inserted or originating muscle that we're going to talk about today, uh, which is interesting to me. And then it's going to attach on the ulna. And then there are times, which is interesting, that uh, it will attach not only to the ulna, but also to the radius. So two different spots on the forearm, it can attach, which was pretty cool. It doesn't happen for everybody. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the, the action for that muscle is going to be uh, flexing at the elbow. Yeah. And if you're interested on more bicep stuff, then make sure you go back and listen into the bicep and tricep episode because that one was great to learn all things upper arm. Absolutely. Then we have the flexor carpi ulnaris, which is going to originate on the ulna and the humerus, and it's going to attach on three bones in the hand. So it's going to run all the way from the top portion of your upper arm all the way into the hand, and it is going to um, help with flexion and adduction of, of the arm, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. The Paul Palmer's longus is going to originate on the humerus and attach on the wrist, and it is also going to be contributing to flexion. And then the flexor carpi radialis is going to originate on the humerus uh, at the base of two bones in the in the hand, and then being able to, oh, I'm sorry, the it's going to originate on the humerus, and then it is going to attach to two separate bones in the hand, and it is also going to be contributing to flexion, but also adduction. And then we have the pronator teres, which is going to originate on the ulna and humerus, and then it is going to attach on the radius, and its big uh, function here is going to help with pronation. Awesome. So if someone's listening to this and they're like, man, that was a mouthful. That's a lot of information. How am I even going to use this within programming? Do I now have to do certain exercises for each and every one of these muscles that you just mentioned? What advice would you give to them? So I think it's important to know the the muscle groups themselves. Uh, the one that's going to have the largest impact from a programming standpoint is going to be the brachialis specifically. We can go into the exercises uh, later on here of exactly how we would implement strengthening that tissue and just being stronger overall with it. Each of them are going to have kind of their own small detail of, of impact that they play. Uh, but in terms of programming, you're not going to have a specific exercise that is to the flexor carpi ulnaris or anything of that, the brachialis is going to have a little bit more direct work, as I said. Mm -hmm. I just thought that that question might be helpful for someone being listening to all of this, trying to take in the information. Because we've both seen of like, when you try to look into something, you then are like, do I know nothing about this thing now that I've learned more? And I think that's part of learning is you're in a place where you're like, I know a lot, you learn a little bit more and you're like, I know nothing. And then you kind of just continue going through that cycle as you continue to learn, improve and be able to really understand the concepts that you're going through. And I'll say for myself, within learning these different things, it just really allows me to understand okay, if someone is feeling pain in a certain point or if someone's not connecting what this muscle needs to be doing, then we can kind of take it back a step and really be able to think about, okay, if it attaches all the way up here, then it makes sense for our arm to move in this way. And I think that that's really the most helpful part of it all. Sure. Um, then we look at the posterior compartment being the extensors, and this is going to be split into two layers being the superficial and deep of 12 total muscles and seven of them being superficial and five being deep. Now with this, I <laughs> took Sue's 
more advice, I suppose, just from what she just said, as I was making the notes initially, I get excited about nerding out over the smallest, intricate details. As I was going through and getting into now the posterior part, I was like, okay, we don't need all this context. So I trimmed it down a little bit where I talked mostly about the brachioradialis, which is going to uh, originate on the humerus um, and then being able to attach on the radius. This is also going to be similar to the uh, brachialis where it is impacting the flexion of the elbow, but the brachioradialis is also going to have a large role in supination. And so if someone is having challenges within um, their elbow or feeling like they're not very strong as they are actively supinating to curl a dumbbell, if we're at a neutral position and then we're bringing the pinky to the, to the thumb as we're curling the dumbbell and they're feeling weak in that, the brachioradialis is something that is not well trained. And so having movements that are actually actively supinating as you curl a dumbbell is really important uh, for the development of the brachioradialis specifically. The other six, as I say here, get super nerdy and specific, and we don't need to know a ton about these, but we have the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, which runs under the brachioradialis. Its action is going to be extension and abduction of the wrist. We have the extensor digitorum uh, communis, which is going to be uh, the main extensor of the fingers. And then we have the extensor digiti uh, manimi, which is probably the weirdest one. And this is, for some people, fused to the digitorum, and its action is going to be extending only the pinky finger and extending the wrist, which I found to be really interesting. Some individuals, this is not fused to the di digitorum, so then you have one muscle contributing the function of all of the fingers. And then you have one muscle that's just separated for just the pinky finger. Um, I wonder how that plays a role in, in coordination. Yeah. And if the people who have them fused together have better coordination relative to the person who they're not fused and separate. That would be an interesting question that I would have. Um, and then we have the final one being the extensor carpi ul ulnaris, which is going to um, contribute to extension and adduction of the wrist. Awesome. Well, very, very helpful information. And as always, I think it's helpful to be able to see that in real life. Because again, we look at muscles and we think about how to grow them, how to make them look different, which you and I are both very passionate about. But we are also very passionate about being able to be able throughout our lives and do certain things. So what are some um, examples of daily activities that you would use your forearms in? Basically everything, uh, typing and writing, driving, lifting weights, uh, carrying things, cooking, eating, opening jars and bottles, uh, brushing your teeth, combing your hair, shaving. <laughs> I mean, the list can literally continue to go because we can use it for when we're uh, working on projects, using tools, uh, playing musical instruments, swinging a golf club, swinging a, a baseball bat, shooting firearms, uh, carrying bags, and a solid handshake and dap up is very important as well. You know, you don't want no fish hand with that <laughs> shake. That's That's a pet peeve of mine when someone just like holds out their hand and then it's just like... It's just a like fish. flopping there. And I'm like, you don't have to break my hand when you shake it, but at least have a little bit of firmness. And, you know, I found out the other day, I feel the same way about hugs. Now, some people it is of like, okay, just like a little side hug and I do a pat. But if someone's giving me a real hug, then like give me a real hug. Again, you don't got to break my back, but just actually go around my body, you know? Sure. Yeah, but I, I mean, it's an interesting question I, for the hugs. I think that there's there's varying levels of hugs depending on your association to the person. Yeah, that's why I said sometimes it is just like an arm around the side and it's kind of like, oh, hey, buddy. <laughs> but if I'm giving a real hug to someone, I'm like, I'm going to give you a hug. Okay. So, But like, who who are those people? Like, what would you put in that tier? I don't know. All my friends. Okay. Who would you put in that tier? I don't know. I, I feel like there's three levels. You have the just being polite and kind hug where you're just, you know, it's not a handshake, but you're just being kind, like you said, with maybe the the arm or, or you're doing double arm, but you're there's some space, right? Yeah. And then you have friends who you're excited to see and you really want to embrace. And so you, you hug them a little bit tighter. And then there's the third tier where it's like, if I was hugging you, 
Mm-hmm. Like I don't hug anyone that <laughs> I don't hug anyone like I hug you. I did actually see a reel about that. It was like, is this appropriate? And it was a groom hugging a bridesmaid. And like it was all this speculation on like how it wasn't appropriate, how he was hugging her. And I didn't feel like it was an inappropriate hug personally because it could have been his sister, could have been his best long best friend long time best friend. There could have been a lot of circumstances there, but I found it very interesting because there are certain ways that like you would hug me that you obviously would not hug other people. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not going for the hug and then grabbing someone else's butt. Well, you know, I would hope not. It's just you. I would hope not. (laughs) Jeez, OP. (laughs) Well, I'm just, you know, clarifying that for everyone. It's like if I hugged Miguel, I'm not doing that. Again, I would hope so. (laughs) Goodness gracious. So outside of being able to do all of those activities that we just talked about, what are other reasons or benefits for training your forearms? The first being injury prevention. A lot of people experience some level of tennis or golf elbow because of the imbalance Mm -hmm. that they have to the flexors and extenders of the forearm. And so uh, that would be the first thing is having that training in place is going to allow for injury prevention to be in a better spot. I think that also just improving grip strength. But I do think, and we've talked about this before, there's a balance of not, okay, I'm going to do this leg movement and I'm not going to use any type of grips because I'm trying to get a stronger grip strength. Strength. And I think that there's times that you focus on your grip strength and you specifically work on it. But if I'm training my legs or my back, those muscles are so much bigger and stronger than my grip. And I don't want to limit what my legs can do and just be like, well, I want to work on my grip strength right this second. It's like kind of choose one in that instance. Right. If you're going to work to improve your grip strength, have that be the focus of the exercise. Don't have your focus be glutes, but then you're also trying to improve your uh, grip strength when your glutes are gonna be the thing that suffer the most. Mm -hmm. The the last thing that I would say is the improvement in dexterity and coordination uh, with, you know, doing things. We talked about all those things that we're able to do with our forearms or that they are contributing to. A lot of these uh, require a fine tooth comb of being able to do specific things. And so the stronger and Im- improved coordination overall is is going to be helpful. So for grip strength for baseball, was it h- important because you needed to like be able to really grip the bat as you're making that contact? Or was it more important for being able to like grip the ball and be able to throw it? I would say with the bat more than the ball itself. And it probably was overplayed a little bit uh, with, as I got older, realizing how much of a swing is really generated from your lower half, your core, and more of your lats than anything. But being able to have strong wrist as you're making contact with a baseball that's being thrown at 90 plus miles an hour is very important and it not just being something where you have weak wrist and as the contact is made, then the, the bat is you know falling back. You don't have enough um, power to drive through the ball. So that would be a, a big tidbit. Yeah. And I know we're talking about forearms, but would that be if like strengthening your forearm would end up strengthening your wrist? Yeah. With, with how much it's the forearm is acting upon the wrist itself, um, then yeah. I'm wondering selfishly because I've always Well, I guess I haven't tried something that would tell me that I have weak wrists currently, but I often had to like tape my wrist if I ever tried to do any kind of tumbling or anything where I had to like really have that wrist strength. And that's something I struggled with a lot. And especially being able to get to like this position, because then I start to move my arm. Yeah, be the extensors that are are weak uh, Mm -hmm. because within the wrist, it's just going to be bone and ligament. There's not going to be real muscle to the wrist itself. It's the forearm. Mm. Well, the more you know, I'm going to get my wrist nice and strong. (laughs) What does it do for that visual appearance? Now you get to flex on all the dads and be like, I have the biggest forearms, but what else? Well, I think it's the greatest indicator of a strong man, just plain and simple. I think that uh, someone who's able to have just meaty forearms is a sign that they're doing things with their their hands. Um, strong man or woman. Sure. And uh, just balance to the arm. Because when you see someone with massive biceps and triceps, which you see this on the internet more than anything, I would say, if they have massive biceps and triceps and don't have a whole lot of forearm development, it looks 
very off. Looks a little wonky. So it's it's important if you're wanting to see just overall growth to your arm and having balance, the meatier forearm will be tremendously helpful. Mm -hmm. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible for you. You should lift heavy. High reps, Carbs low are weight. needed. Keto Squats are bad for your Squats knees. are great You should squat ass to grass. Toes. It's fine. It fits my macros. for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one on one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join physique development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Now, you already said you did the wrist roller a lot, which I know that you've, you, we have a wrist roller in our gym, an actual one, not a Folgers can, um, and you use that often. But what are some other exercises that you would recommend to people or program um, for that forearm strength? So I would encourage the, the hammer curls and the Zotman curls being really helpful with the brachialis. We talked about uh, having a supinating dumbbell curl. So as you are curling the dumbbell, you're actively supinating. That will help with the brachial radialis. And then we have things like the dumbbell or easy bar reverse curls. You can do reversed wrist curls. You can do uh, wrist curls with your arm being supported on a bench. So you'd be taking a knee with your uh, forearms resting on the bench with your wrist hanging off with the weight. And then you would be able to um, do them in reverse if your palm is facing this. I'm sorry, if your uh, top of your hand is facing the ceiling, that would be the reverse curls. And then if the palms are facing the ceiling, then those would just be regular wrist curls. I'm about to add those to my programming. Yeah. And uh, towel pull-ups was one that I did a lot in high school, actually, mm -hmm. for just overall grip strength. We use them for football, uh, being able to shed blockers, being able to block and, and hold on to jerseys, hold on to shoulder pads. That was a great exercise as you're able to overload within weight as you can, you know, put more weight on you as you're doing the pull-ups themselves. Uh, farmer's carries are great. Pinch carries are another one that we did a lot through what high school. Pinch carry? So you're taking like a, you could take two plates that are steel and then you're pinching them mm. kind of like a crab walk, if you will. Well, not a crab walk because that's an actual thing where you're on the ground, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but you're, you're pinching two plates together or you can do it with a bumper plate. Mm. So we, we used to do them with the, the bumper plates and I still do them with oh the, the bumper plates now. I wouldn't have that finger strength whatsoever. Yeah, you would. No. Oh my gosh. Did you watch the bouldering at the Olympics? No. The amount of finger strength that they have is un truly unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, rock climbing is a massive part. Like forearms are a massive part of that. Yeah. Well, with these nails, it's a little bit hard to grip things, but <laughs> outside of that, I don't know if I would have it um, regardless. <laughs> well, we have the bumper plates all the way down to 20. We have 25s, 35s, and 45s. I bet you could do the 25s. We'll see. Okay. Maybe maybe we'll do a little test and we'll uh, be able to see if I can actually do that. Then we have the wrist roller, which I think is is useful. It's often rushed so that people just want to go as fast as humanly possible. And you want to really go through flexion and being able to move the wrist as you and move the straight out. And your arm straight out. That's right. what I learned from you was I tried to do it with my arms a little bit a little in bit and try to cheat. And yeah. you were like, nope, you got don't a little bit do of leverage doing it that way. And then the last one being dead hangs, which is going to be more of an isometric training endurance relative to gaining strength, if you will. Mm -hmm. Or even a flexed arm hang. Would sure. be a good one to do. And you can mimic a lot of these exercises with cables as well. Um, so those would be my favorites. Awesome. Well, I have a few more questions for you. Do I need to do direct forearm training if I'm lifting without straps or VersaGrips? Yes. I, I think that it's going to be important for the overall development of your forearms. Do I think that you should immediately add in a bunch of direct forearm training at the moment? It just depends on the person um, and, and where they're at within their wrist stability, how they feel within the strength. Those things I think will be important to add in. So if someone's doing like a press of some sort and they find that their 
wrists are always kind of caving in? Would that be something where it's like, okay, let's work on some more wrist strength because you have the shoulder strength to push the actual weight, but it's your wrists that are your limiting factor here. Yeah, I would, I would encourage incorporating some direct grip strength or forearm training. Mm -hmm. I think it's just good to see in an example of like, what would I see in the gym that would be like, hey, maybe I need to work on my grip strength or my forearms a little bit more. Mm -hmm. All right. And will forearms make my wrists thicker? This is a great question because we've already kind of touched on it. Mm -hmm. But no, your wrists are going to be mostly just bone and tendon. So the, the meat of your forearm as you get stronger, as you create more hypertrophy, the muscle is more dense. It's going to be more towards your elbow relative to your wrist. Okay. And last question I have for you. Is it normal to feel pain in my wrist when I'm lifting? not normal to feel pain. Can you f feel like a, a mild level of discomfort? Sure. But if you're feeling pain, then we'd want to assess, are we lacking strength on either the flexors or the extensors? Do we have something going on within how we're performing the exercise that's causing the pain? And then being able to go from there, changing the program design, changing your form within the exercise to remove the, the pain that you're experiencing. Any other things that you would add in about forearms that you want the people to know? No, I, I feel like I've already provided more than what people <laughs> wanted to know about forearms. Yeah, you never know. There could be some people who love learning about these things like you do. Very possible. Yeah. Well, how about diving into calves? Yeah, sure. So with the calves, this is going to be uh, the muscles that make up the lower extremity of the leg or right below the knee joint and mainly produce movement of the foot and ankle. And one portion of the calf is going to cross the knee and play a big role in flexion and stability of the knee itself. Gotcha. And with calves, I know that you also want to get jacked calves personally. Um, so we'll be diving into some different mistakes people make and being able to talk about how you have grown your calves. But let's go ahead and dive into the different actions um, that your calf is going through. With the actions of the calf, we're going to be acting upon the ankle. And the ankle is a hinge joint. So we have dorsiflexion, which is going to be bringing your toes closer to your shin uh, or raising your toe, I suppose is a good way of putting that. This is mainly going to be produced by the anterior group of the, the calf, which we're going to get into the groupings here shortly. We have plantar flexion, which is going to be taking your toes away from you, pointing them down. And this is mostly produced by the posterior group of the calf. We have eversion, which is going to be uh, produced by the lateral group. And then we have inversion, which is mostly produced by the tibialis posterior and the tibialis anterior. You know, I will go ahead and admit that it wasn't until a few years ago that I knew that there was an anterior part of the calf because I just always thought it was just the back of your lower leg. And I think it was five or six years ago when you had expressed that to me of being able to say like, oh, do it this way so you can hit the front. And I was like, the front of what? So um, just a little fun fact, <laughs> anterior and posterior. This is true. Um, so with the different actions that we, we have, the calf is going to be split into three separate compartments of the anterior, the posterior, and the lateral portion. And this is a total of 13 muscle groups, which is crazy to me. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about the muscles that we can truly train and, and see hypertrophy and it, it making a visual change to the calf, we're going to get into that here momentarily. But let's talk about how the the three groups are made up uh, within the, the muscles themselves. So we have the anterior group or the dorsiflex group, which is the tibialis anterior, the extensor digitorum longus, the fibularis ter 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 tertius, mm -hmm. and the extensor hallucis halus longus. Sure. I listened to so many like... YouTube videos <laughs> of pronunciation on these. And I was hopeful that I was going to re remember them better as we got in here. And uh, it's not as sharp in my brain. They sound great to me. Honey. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs> uh, then we have the posterior or plantar flexion group, which is split into two layers. And so the superficial layer is the gastrocnemius, which is the one that everybody wants to have 
in a better spot. That gastroc is going to be that softball in the back of your calf that is just going to be the meatiest part. And then we have the plantar and the soleus. The gastroc and the soleus are going to be the two uh, parts of the calf that you're most familiar with when it comes to exercise. And like I said, we're going to get into that here in a second. And then we have the deep layer of the posterior group being the tibialis posterior, the flexor hallucis longus, the popliteus and the flexor digitorum longus. The last group is the lateral group, which is the fibular group. And the two muscles that make that up are the fibularis longus and the fibularis brevis. Awesome. I'm going to, I have that all memorized now. <laughs> the person I, I just see the listeners just like cranking on notes. <laughs> You have a cheat sheet in your email inbox if you've subscribed. If you're on our email list, then you basically get all of our goodies and freebies without having to do much but already sign up for our email list. But if you're one of the people listening to this and you're like, I don't like email lists, I didn't sign up for that, you're missing out. And we will have a link down below. And each ev episode of the Muscle Group series, we have had a cheat sheet so that all of this information is broken down. You get links to playlists going over the exercises and so much more. So don't forget to check that out. Because I imagine as you guys are taking notes on this episode, you're probably like, how in the world do I spell what he just butchered? <laughs> and you can get the cheat sheet and it's already right there for you. Mm -hmm. And so if you want it for just memory's sake and being able to write it, then you have the reference point of the cheat sheet. So subscribe to the email list, get the cheat sheets, and you'll get even more out of this free resource that is far more than you would. I mean, this is like a real anatomy course, basically. Yeah. For truly. free. For, for free. With direct application. To, to exactly what you want to do. Exactly. I mean, it is a, a no-brainer to get on that stinking email list. And you know, I just had a thought. If we give away all of this incredible content for free, I wonder what it looks like once people pay us to do something. It's crazy. Um, you should sign up for one-on-one -on -one coaching. Just a thought. That's what I would do. Anyway, um, the anterior group is very important for the swing phase of your gait cycle. Now, the gait cycle is described as one stride length of the leg split into two main phases that alternate for each lower leg. So this is when we are running, when we're walking, we have a gait cycle. And those two phases are going to be the stance and the swing. The stance is when the foot is on the ground and the swing is when the foot is in the air. And so when we talk about the swing or the anterior group being very important here, this is where a lot of people are going to be getting like shin splints and, and those different factors. So strengthening that tissue is going to be very important and understanding that that is going to help you as you are propelling yourself or, or you know, getting into the next step. Um, and then the posterior group, I'm sure you can guess this, is that it is very, very important to the stance phase when the leg is or the foot is on the ground or starting to elevate and push into the next step, if you will. So you talked about the gastroc and the soleus being the ones that people know the most about. So even though people are the most familiar with them, where do those muscles originate? So for the gastroc, we're going to originate on the medial and lateral portion of the femur. So of your upper leg, that's the one muscle group that's going to cross the knee. And we're going to have a lateral and medial head of the gastrocnemius. So it's the largest muscle group in the calf, I believe. Um, it is going to attach with the soleus muscles. So this is where it's very interesting. It's going to converge with the soleus, which we're about to get into. So it's converging with another muscle group to form what is called the uh, calcaneal tendon. And then that tendon is going to continue to run down and insert on the calcaneus, which is a portion of the, the back of the foot. So you have a muscle that is going to go from above the knee and attach on the femur, run all the way down your lower leg, and then being able to attach to the back of your, of your foot or your heel. Uh, I mean, that's a very yeah. large muscle. Obviously it, it is, it is, um, converging with the soleus, but even then that is a massive length of, of a muscle. Um, and then you have the, the soleus, which is going to originate at the head of the fibula and the medial border of the tibia. So 
the bones of the lower leg at the top portion. And then it is also going to attach with the, or at the calcaneus via the calcaneal tendon that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Going back to the gastroc and talking about the action, this is the one muscle group like we've talked about, crossing the knee and going to play a pivotal role in the flexion at the knee. And so that first 15 degrees of flexion at the knee is going to be very dependent on the the gastroc. You often will see people doing like a lying hamstring curl and they will generate a ton of force at the bottom of that exercise. And they'll be like, man, my calves are on fire. I don't feel like I'm getting a whole lot of my hamstrings. That's because that portion of the calf is crossing the knee and dictating and has a lot of leverage at the very beginning of starting to flex at the knee. So the gastroc contributes there, and then it's also going to be a large contributor to the plantar flexion or pointing the toes down, lifting yourself up onto your toes. Mm -hmm. And same with the soleus there for the plantar flexion. Correct. And then we have the tibialis anterior, and this runs alongside the front lateral portion of the shin and it originates on the tibia and it's going to attach at a bone in the foot just behind the big toe called the first metatarsal. The action of that tibialis anterior is going to be dorsiflexion uh, and bringing the toes towards you or elevating your your foot um, or your, yeah, your toes. Mm -hmm. The last one I wanted to highlight was the fibularis longus, and this is going to originate at the head and lateral surface of the fibula, and it attaches behind the base of that first metatarsal, and then the action is going to be the eversion of the foot and assisting in plantar flexion. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing, turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty? I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal? grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program. Because you are awesome and I want you to have this program, I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. So now that we've gone through all of that, how about what we use our calf muscles for on a day-to-day basis? Everything again. (laughs) Both of these muscle groups are are daily users. So walking, running, climbing upstairs, uphill walking, standing on your toes, balancing, jumping, sitting and standing transitions, driving, gardening and and housework, um, dancing, playing sports, lifting weights, like literally almost everything. So even if I don't want big calves, I should still train them? Yes. I I think that it's a tremendous importance to be able to function as as best as you can. Um, And and I think we go back to one one tidbit that we've shared at some point throughout this uh, series. I think it was on the hamstring episode where we had said that as you as you get past 30, there's a very small percentage of people who no longer sprint again. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you just atrophy that tissue by not training it over time. And I think that that's uh, a, a big issue because it's going to play a role in your in your posture and being able to walk properly and so on. So just in your day-to-day activity, it has a, a large role. Yeah. So I think I see a lot of former athletes talk about the aches and pains that they have now. And part of it can be from injury from the sport 100%. I know that you deal with some lingering injuries from sports, but it can also be due to you were doing a lot of activity and working these muscles, and now they've just been atrophying for years because you haven't really done anything for them. And that can cause a ton of um, like disability for you to function. And so being able to know of, okay, even if I, maybe I don't love training in the gym, 
maybe just even going twice a week to kind of run through a few of the muscles or going and stretching sometimes can really help you out, alleviate those aches and pains, and make sure that you're able to function as you continue to age. Absolutely. What would you say are some of the benefits or reasons that you should train calves? I feel like we've touched on some of these, but does anything come to mind? Injury prevention, like I just um, touched on, but improving your balance and stability. So like you said, standing up on your toes, there's times in yoga where they're like, stand up on your toes and then do this, this, and this. And I will find myself kind of losing my balance. And it's a nice reminder of, okay, all of these things work together. And being able to have some stronger muscles is going to help me overall for my flexibility and function there. I could not agree more. And I think that uh, another tidbit would be improving overall endurance. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking about if you were to take your kids to Disney, like what are some of the things that are going to be painful that day of getting 20,000 plus steps? Probably your ankle, probably your feet, probably your hips, maybe your shoulders if you're carrying a backpack. And so these things, like small things that you can keep in mind of, I just need to make sure that I'm training this tissue and getting improved overall endurance uh, with my activity. And that endurance is going to be improved with just repetition. It doesn't have to be direct resistance training. This can be running on a regular basis. This can be going and getting steps on a regular basis, being intentional with how you're walking and not just dragging your feet and mm -hmm. being the most annoying person of just like that <laughs> noise when someone's walking constantly of just their feet dragging and they're using no muscular, no muscles in their lower leg to just stand up and walk normal is very irritating to me. Yeah. And it can improve your lower body strength. So I know a lot of people listening want to grow their glutes or improve other things within their lower body and being able to have your calves in a better spot can really help support that because you also have to think of no muscle works in isolation. And so a lot of these muscles are stabilizer muscles. And so if those stabilizing muscles aren't strong, then when you're trying to bias the actual muscle, you are going to hit a wall of I can't get any more out of this because I can't stabilize it anymore. And so that's a big thing for me of, okay, if I can improve my overall lower body strength, then I'm going to do it. Want to hear a ridiculous concern I have? Sure. Is that I have a fear that I will be pulled over in the evening one day and be given a breathalyzer test, blow zeros, but they're like, we want to just test a little bit further. Mm -hmm. And then they get me out there to like walk the fine line. And then for whatever reason, they have me stand up on one leg and I'm now stumbling and bumbling because I don't have great balance. Why would I go to the pin for not being able to stand up on one leg? That's ridiculous. So I, I would be very well prepared in that very weird, not going to happen scenario. But I have this un weird thought that it's going to happen and I just want to be prepared. Yeah, because it helps your posture and your alignment overall. And you know, one other thing, circulation and blood flow, which that's something, especially as people age, I hear a lot of feeling like they're losing good circulation to their body. And that can be a huge thing of just, hey, if I actually have blood flow to these places, then I'm going to be feeling better. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that when we're talking about the ankle and being able to move through a greater range of motion, a lot of people that are sitting at a desk all day that don't go through a full range of motion for their ankle, it, it creates kind of like this cement locked position for that ankle. And it's very uncomfortable. It does not you know, feel good, obviously. And so having the training in place and especially things like yoga, being able to stand up on one leg, being able to get up on the toes and stand tall and have the balance, um, very helpful, just overall function. Mm -hmm. Now, visual appearance, again, you just want to be able to have that huge calf. But I think a big part of it, and this is something for me, is not having a peg leg because I used to have peg legs because I never really worked my calves because I didn't know how to, I didn't want to, a multitude of different reasons. And it was something where I would have this developed muscle on my leg and then it would just kind of go to this peg leg and I always had an issue. I think that was something within wearing shorts as I didn't want really my calves to show, not because I wanted these huge jacked calves, but I just wanted some shape and balance to my lower leg. Um, and so there are some ways to get around it in regards of like, oh, I'm going to wear some higher socks and kind of throw this balance off. But it's something 
something that has really helped of like, okay, just that visual appearance of my legs overall. Yeah. Balance and proportion to the leg visually and then not having the peg leg. Mm -hmm. Cause I, it's a, it's an interesting look if somebody just has very well developed quads and hamstrings, glutes, and then they just don't have a whole lot of calf tissue. It's a, oh, it's I got an odd pictures look. of myself. It is an odd look for sure. Uh, so what are some common training mistakes? I'm going to say skipping. It is definitely a training mistake because I've personally done that numerous times in my training career. I think skipping it, um, having inconsistent training, uh, people will go like two or three weeks and skip their calf training and then hit it really hard one day and be like, my gosh, my calves are so sore. So, well, you got a fraction of your volume in for the entire month and thinking that that one session is going to make this big difference for you. And so the infrequency of getting the training in and then expecting a result that you would experience for a muscle that you're training consistently and then being like, why is this not working? I train my calves all the time. They're so genetic. I hate that phrase. I can agree with you. I think another thing is that full range of motion um, and training in that way. And there is some research that states of like, hey, you might not need the entire range of motion to see that growth. But I think that, again, we're looking at growth and function as two separate things. And so it's good to be able to take your body through a range of motion. And then it might be, okay, maybe I'm not training it through that entire range, but even knowing I can take it through that entire range is very helpful. This would go alongside of that of just using excess loads. Oftentimes if someone is going to have excessive amounts of weight in, they're probably not getting to the full amount of, of dorsiflexion that, or I'm sorry, plantar flexion that they're needing to, to get to, to finish a, you know, standing calf raise, uh, calf raise on the leg press, those different things. So what are your go-to exercises for yourself or for programming for clients? So the standing calf raise is going to be number one, doing it either single leg or uh, with both legs, uh, utilizing the Smith machine. If you do not have an actual standing calf machine at your gym, just putting uh, plates down so that you can use that as your uh, elevation to be able to get into the dorsiflexion to get to the bottom, and then being able to really drive the, the heel up and drive the, uh, the, the lower leg forward so you can get as best of plantar flexion as possible. Then we have the the seated calf, which with some research is going to be more uh, tailored to towards the soleus. There's been more recent research that the standing calf is actually going to produce a <clears throat> similar level of growth to the soleus and gastroc, which previously was not the case. So I'm curious to see that research continue to uh, further and, and strengthen everybody's understanding. Then we have the uh, calf press on the leg press, which is probably my second favorite. Mm -hmm. I like the standing calf and then I really like the uh, calf press on the leg press. I think it's a uh, stability wise, a great option and, and a, a way for you to um, probably go against or, or be challenged by the most load in the three that you talk about there of the standing calf, the seated calf, and then the calf press on the leg press. Uh, reason being for that, uh, maybe because it, from a distance perspective of where the weights know, I don't I'd know say why. the stabilization of it and just kind of like the fact of when you're doing a standing one, it's going to like you're holding the weight on your back. Um, if you're using like a Smith machine, if you obviously have a standing calf, you still have the weight like on your shoulders versus if you're in the um, leg press, then it's like you're able to be stable in there and really just focus on that ankle. At least that's what I find for myself. Sure. Uh, we have the tibialis raises, which you can have a machine for this where you're putting the forefront of your foot into a contraption that has a pad on the top and then like a foot plate on the bottom. And then you're raising your toes or bringing your toes closer, uh, to your, to your shin. Um, and then you can also do that with kettlebells and dumbbells. It's not as easy to do. The machine is much better, but you can do it with kettlebells and dumbbells. Sled drags, which is great. And then we also have jumping rope from a endurance standpoint. And jumping rope is something that I recommend to a lot of 
my clients who are wanting to get into running and just getting that endurance of being able to be up on the forefront of their foot, being up on their toes, a uh, very useful tool there. Yeah. And I think that that's something worth mentioning of for you seeing a lot of your calf growth was being able to get into running and to be able to have more blood flow towards your calves and towards your ankles and being able to really work on being able to move them the correct way. Because I feel like what you've told me is that you just felt like you couldn't get that full range of motion before. And now having to be up on your toes and to put that consistent endurance in, um, then that's really been a big thing for you. Yes, absolutely. And then like we talked about earlier with yoga, that helping with your overall stability, balance and uh, ability to get into greater ranges of motion. Awesome. Well, I just have a few questions before I finish up here. So can I actually grow my calves or is it all genetics? <laughs> How they look in terms of like the insertion point is going to be largely genetic, but the density and the ability to grow the tissue is just like any other muscle group. You can still grow that muscle. And I just want to put a little asterisk here that like Alex said, genetics do determine of like different lengths of bones and muscles and all that jazz, but it's just being able to learn how to work with that instead of against that. And that's been a huge thing for me personally in many muscle groups, not just talking about calves, but like glutes, that's been a huge thing for me of, okay, with my proportions and how things are laid out, how do I need to train? Because you and I both have very different body types and how you train to get huge glutes looks a little bit different than how I need to train or how I need to execute a movement to be able to get those glutes. And so I feel like that's the aspect of its genetics is, okay, I might have to train a little bit differently, but it doesn't inhibit me from getting those results. It's just you need to be able to learn about your body or have a coach help you learn about your body so that you can have those results you're looking for. Absolutely. All right. What calf exercises are best for runners? They will all be great. Uh, if I had to pick favorites, I would uh, put the single leg standing calf raise as probably my number one. I think jumping rope, as I had talked about, and then the weighted tibialis rage raises all being probably a, a good starting point to have those three in your regimen, honestly, as frequently as you can handle and be able to recover from. And then last question, will pointing my toes out or pointing my toes in when doing calf raises change what part of the calf that I am training? It's interesting because a study in 2011 found that pointing the toes out uh, allowed for a little bit more medial growth. And then as you pointed the toes in, there was more lateral growth. As we've seen more research be conducted and completed from 2011, we found that to not be the case. I don't think that a single study has found the same outcome since that study was published in 2011. So I would recommend to just have your toes facing forward, go through a great range of motion, train the calves consistently, progressively overload over time. Don't skip sessions. Don't let it be the very end of your session and just be like, well, I'm running out of time. If you find yourself constantly saying, I want to grow my calves, but I always end up running out of time on my lower body days, just put it as your first exercise. Like have it be the first exercise that you do um, because obviously it's not that important to you Yeah. because then you would either figure out a way to get it in and move it to the top of the session or give yourself more time to finish your complete session as you have it written out. Yeah. And sometimes what I'll do is being able to take some of that excess volume of things that I really did run out of time and maybe something came up and I couldn't have planned around it. And then I have a day that it's like, okay, I'm doing like calves and abs and some miscellaneous exercises there. And it might not be the most ideal, but what I'm really looking at is for that consistency and then how it fits within my schedule. So there might be a day where it's like, I can't train today, like a full on training session, but maybe I go in there, I stretch, I do some calves, I do some abs, and then I call it quits. And that's another way that you can still show up for the volume, show up for the consistency um, for something that it's like maybe you needed to stretch and get steps in anyways. And so you just go and do that, you tack it on, and then you're good to go. Perfect. Awesome. Anything else about calves you want to say? I have talked the entire episode. No. So you are all good. All right. Make sure you tune in next week for the last episode of the Muscle Series. And we are going to be going over upper back and rear delts. And if you haven't already, make sure that you give us a review on Apple Podcasts. And we'll catch you in the next one.